All right, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this is our day two of Design and Thinking 101. Um, so we will do a quick recap of what we did in the previous session. Uh, we talked about um, starting with human beings, essentially um, people with their needs, understanding people and their needs, their possibilities, experience, and knowledge. Uh, that, that's, that was our starting point for all considerations. Uh, and also people uh, understanding the people's pleasure, which is what they, um, what their positive feelings are versus their frustrations, which is their pains, and have tasks to be fulfilled. So in everyone's day-to-day -day life, they have certain things which they enjoy, there are certain things which they don't enjoy, and how do we understand all of that uh, from a human being's perspective rather than thinking of all, all of us as machines which are performing day-to-day -day tasks, right? We also talked about biases uh, and and we uh, we talked about how do we ensure that um, <clears throat> uh, the consideration for somebody uh, who sits alone behind the closed doors, uh, how can we ensure that uh, we understand what they go through on their day-to-day uh, -day lives instead uh, living it from doing it, uh, which essentially is uh, the, the thing that you see on the screen where it says design thinking is all about doing. So rather than sitting in our, in our own desks, uh, and this is just a hypothetical thing, that sitting in our own desks, we are presuming what somebody else is going through uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, rather than doing that, we behave like them and be, uh, live their lives in order to understand um, what their problems are and whatever solutions we are designing are, are going to help them. So building prototypes or building policies or building processes would only be successful if we get into the shoes of our end users. So that was our story so far. Uh, we also talked about this, where we said that our mission is to develop teams who believe that the world can be a better place and that they can be the ones to make it happen, essentially implementing some of these practices and tools that allow us um, to do so uh, with the framework what we started with what we call as design thinking so this was a graphic that i <laughs> that i showed you guys in the previous session you would see that there are a little bit of tweaks in what you'd see on the internet uh, we also showed some of those things when you when you search for design thinking you'd find them on the images section on google but essentially what we have done here is and i would call out the changes is that we have broken the empathize section into understand and observe. Very critical in our kind of business where we understand the problem, define a problem statement, and then start observing. Uh, I've seen a lot of times where our design teams, our internal um, uh, teams, our content teams, technology teams, name it, right? Um, we have had problems where we have started doing research, we have started understanding what the user's pain areas are and, and trying to define and ideate and come up with solutions without the, the clear understanding of what the problem is, which is where understand makes a very important uh, role. And that's why we have started calling it out as understand as a separate phase. There are inputs and outputs of understand, there are inputs and outputs for observe as well as every other section, but uh, just wanted to call out that understand is a very critical piece here, right? And one important other thing which you would see in some of the uh, uh, some of the <coughs> excuse me uh, some of those uh, graphics that you would search over the internet is something called as reflect, which allows us to continuously improve and have an iterative way of uh, really testing whatever we have done, is, is that the right way or can it be improved? Think about it in any other scenario where, um, uh, where we have tried and implement something using design thinking. Now, there has to be a periodic check in order to ensure that whatever we have done, is it also applicable in today? Because it was done, let's say, a year back. Uh, is there a room of, of improvement? And that really allows us to go back and start evaluating ourselves in terms of what we have done in the past and how can we improve upon it. 
right? I showed you this graphic where uh, we talked about um, individuals who have been in the system for long, uh, people who have come up, uh, come in as experts in their own areas. Uh, we all get into a biased situation where we say that we know what we're talking about, but instead of doing that, can we have a beginner's mindset, which also gives us a room for improvement where we say, I wonder what could this be? What else could this be, right? Rather than saying, I know all the time. This is just a terminology change, but think about it, that I wonder gives us so much of possibility uh, where we understand how the company runs, how the uh, department runs, how people behave with a certain department, with a certain tool set, with a platform, let's say, for example, InfoWeb. But I wonder would really give us a lot of opportunities to go and explore. Um, right. And then, of course, uh, to, um, to ensure that we're not, uh, we're not biased, so if your mindset is unprejudiced, it is open to everything, which is what I just talked about. In a beginner's mind, there are possibilities, but in experts' mind, there are only few. Because we always come up with a problem, templated problem, and a templated solution. Every time, we're going to retrofit the same thing again and again. But if we have this beginner's mindset, we would always try to look for possibilities. And that is what it was all about. Now, there were certain principles that we talked about in the previous session where we said that we are always thinking and focused on people. <coughs> Design thinking is driven by curiosity. Uh, we always work with interdisciplinary teams, which ensures that we are not really doing things in our own siloed environments. We're involving people from other walks of life, other departments, uh, and um, other uh, skill sets to ensure that they can come in and bring in their own ideas because design thinking is all about coming up with multiple ideas right uh, trying to experiment as much as we can iterate be mindful of course uh, in terms of where you are at and what you'd want to achieve rather than getting too much into the um, in the black hole of design thinking where we are just experimenting and not really implementing anything right but uh, one important key here uh, for you guys is visualizing and showing, which which means that we've we've we talk about so many things and we talk about so many ideas that everyone has. But how do we put that into some sort of a visual uh, thing? It could be a it could be a flow diagram. It could be a, a journey map. It could be anything. It could be just don't think about the. Um, the the process, right? Think about the output where we are saying that I can draw something on a whiteboard, take a picture, maybe use post-it notes, maybe just scribble on my notepad, but try and create a visual of that whole piece, which helps everyone to understand what you're trying to say. Essentially, um, not everyone could be a, a great communicator or not everything that you're thinking in your head could be um, articulated in a way where everyone in a meeting or in a group would understand your idea. But if you put that on a paper, you would also uh, be able to explain it much better, right? And people would be able to understand what you're trying to explain, right? So the whole entirety of that idea really comes up really uh, amazingly when you're trying to do a visual, visual uh, show and tell, right? Uh, bias towards action is what we just talked about. And of course, accepting the complexity of everything that we're trying to get into. I mean, people might get overwhelmed with when we say that we have to follow a process and think uh, and just trust the process and follow the guidelines. I mean, for people, it is overwhelming at times, but understanding the complexity is a key that you are trusting the process, you're trusting a framework which is which has been defined and run by some successful uh, big giant companies, right? But essentially accepting that you're trying to get into uh, a complex piece is really uh, important thing. So don't think that it's like a straight line. So we do step one, step two, step three, step four, and we'll be done. It's not like that. It's a mishmash of things. Uh, and I remember showing you a graphic which more or less looks like a net. And that's what uh, the designing process and innovation process is all about. Right. 
<coughs> we also talked about this graphic where we said that it is all user centered. So the user or the end customer is at the center, at the core of every conversation that we have, every uh, design that we do. And like I said, design, everyone on this call is a designer. We design day in and day out. Everything that we do is designing, right? We design our workstations, we design our desktop, we design our, uh, our, 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 our workspace, we design our office, we design policies, we design uh, frameworks, we design a system, we give inputs to interface design, experience design for things like onboarding process and uh, info web and so on and so forth. So don't think of yourself as non-designers because everyone is either helping or trying to be part of that design process and that's where uh, all of you are designers. Okay, <clears throat> okay I'll move forward. Now, uh, today we're going to talk, touch upon key aspects of what design thinking is and where it applies to human resource, all right? So um, just start thinking from here on, how can you use some of these tools and principles and uh, uh and 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 the things that i'm going to talk about in your day-to-day -day lives and then i'll also talk about some of the implementations that companies do on a on a hr uh front right so <clears throat> empathy uh as uh, we all understand is walking into the shoes of somebody else right but what exactly does it mean um how do we know what our users slash customers have difficulties with? Now, not knowing the everyday life of people means we continuously make assumptions of, uh, on which we base our decisions. Right? Um, at least I have seen a lot of times that when we talk to individuals, we have a perception in mind. When we talk to a department, we always have a perception in mind. Oh, these guys are not going to respond back to our emails. These, this individual is going to sit on uh, a question that we have asked, right? This is all based on a assumption that we have sitting in our heads. Right? Now, we don't try and understand what that individual or that department is going through. Maybe they're overloaded with work. They are they're running a small department of 10 odd people and doing the job of 50. Uh, people, right? So what they go to in their day-to-day -day lives is something that we don't understand, and empathy is all about understanding that, so that we can be, uh, we can uh, have the, have an unbiased um, thought process when we are trying to uh, interact with them. About eight million people live in um, uh, live in a state. Let's let's take an example, right? Uh, eight to ten million people, uh, million people live in a state, right? Um, and let's say um, uh, if an individual who uh, lives in that particular uh, state or used to live in that state, and um, you can take an example of Maharashtra or yeah, West Bengal or any state in India or any any state in the, in the U.S., right? And uh, and uh, she claims to have lived uh, her. Um, let's say 20 years of her life in that um, small village or that small town where she comes from and claims to understand um, the people and what they go through into their day-to-day -day lives, right? Uh, so she would be treated like somebody who has knowledge about the demographics, about the people, how they behave, uh, what they eat, uh, how they live their lives, right? When the market's open, when it closes, right? People, uh, do they... Uh, love going out and spending uh, late nights and doing parties or uh, is that a town where people just shut down everything at 7 p.m and then they're uh, on uh, off to sleep right so <clears throat> that individual claims to <clears throat> understand all of that because she has lived like 20 years there okay now she's moved uh, moved on from that city or town uh, from or that village and she's now living in, let's say, uh, a city like Mumbai or um, let's say New York, right? And she's been living there for ten years now, right? So whenever there is a uh, there is a conversation, she claims to understand what goes into the lives of uh, the people back uh, in her uh, hometown or her village or her city where she comes from. But we have to understand uh that 
although she has an experience uh, um, living in that town or city, right? Um, and she has access to access to certain aspects of that town or village in her life, but she's she can be treated like a more like a subject matter expert rather than somebody who understands, right? So she is, according to design thinking, she's incapable of developing a perfect solution for the people living in that village or that town, because um, the majority of uh, of the needs of that um, of the people who live there can only be given by the people who belong to that place and who are still living there rather than somebody who used to be there, right? So all of us have come from different cities uh, or different towns. We have had uh, a place where we had lived. We have moved on to bigger cities, uh, most of us, right? Uh, but essentially we always go think about how do we used to go to our schools and our colleges and what was the world back then, right? And we always have that perception that today also, it's exactly like that. But essentially things have changed and things continuously change. So somebody who claims to understand with the experience of being there or being into that situation is fine. But according to design thinking, she or he is not 100% capable of articulating the exact same things or problems that the individuals in that village or town go through today, right? So essentially what I'm trying to say is experience is great. Experience is really um, um, acknowledged by design thinking, but it is always doing and trying to find out is the, is the whole idea where you go back and always validate your findings and your uh, um, hypothesis, so to speak, right? And thus, that's what it is all about, rather than coming with a bias and saying that I know. All right, so now the first thing that we um, saw in that whole graphic was observe, right? And if and it, and an effective starting point uh, for designing new new policy, new uh, framework, uh, new technology, new software is to clearly identify um, an existing problem or user need. Finding a big problem or need often yield to untapped opportunity uh, for improvement or for design. Right? Observing people can also help uh, you build empathy and think from the point of view walk in somebody else's shoe and uh, and trying to document what you have understood uh, there was somebody called as uh, uh, Bronis law uh, who was um, who was a white male who was struck in an African country um, during World War one. And during this period, he developed the practice of uh, participant observation, uh, which remains as the hallmark of ethnographic research even today. Uh, this kind of immersive user research has gained prominence over the past uh, few decades. Uh, speeding time with people, uh, sorry, spending time with people rather than um, doing what they do, doing their work, uh, participating with them, uh, living their lives. Uh, you can get beyond the surface of things that people might say in focus group, right? So essentially we always think that, and uh, please understand the, uh, the difference in between talking to people and asking what do you want versus seeing and observing how they do things. Uh, there is a huge difference. So when we go and ask people what your problem is, uh, let's say it's an onboarding process or it's a, uh, it's a uh, let's say diversity problem, or uh, it could be any area uh, in uh, or, tra or training, for example, right? When we go and ask people, what's your problem? Uh, what they would say and what they would need are two different things. So spending time with people uh, is, uh, is it is an exact opposite thing of asking them what do you what's your problem today? Right. Um, 
that would really take us beyond the surface of things uh, where people might say uh, into a group uh, when we talk to them and learn about what they actually do and care about right so i as an individual would say uh, calcul uh, would use calculated statements uh, when i'm expressing myself either i will open up too much or i would probably say 20% of what i really do uh, in my day-to-day -day life in order to explain my problem or I would make it so big that it is not big enough uh, when I go when I do it myself right so what people say and what they do are two completely different things and the whole idea about observing is to see what they do is to observe them silently or be with them uh, it, it's all about that right uh, and I bet you you would find all things that uh, that are normal uh, to people uh, there uh, that are completely unfamiliar to you. So uh, they might not have expressed anything uh, when they were talking to you and you would find so many things which are really um, amazing and new uh, when you spend time with them. There's an old saying that a fish doesn't realize that they are they are in they, they live in the water. Uh, but uh, only if you swim with them, you would realize that they are in water, right? As a fish who has that environment and has always been there, they would never know that they are in that environment. But only when you participate as an outsider, you would understand that there are things which that those individuals go through on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, that is what is going to come out because <clears throat> we always try to uh, as individuals we always try to find out a way of doing things uh, right and uh, the problems is where we kind of take a deviation and trying to make a shortcut and achieve our jobs when somebody comes in and asks uh, if there was there is a problem we've always already found a solution on our own and we don't really care because that has become our way of living and doing things. So observing from as an outsider really helps to understand and articulate what people go through when they are in the interview process or onboarding process or uh, or doing their journey within learning it or trying to get into a performance management kind of a thing, right? Are they getting the real feedback that they should be getting? Are they getting in on time? Are they expecting that or they are just doing it for the sake of doing it, right? All of these things can just get answered when we try and observe things. So I'd put this graphic once again in front of you, but now we would go and look at some of the tools that uh, I talked about, which can be implemented uh, uh, during the design thinking process. So let me stop sharing and I'll share my screen once again. And these are some of the documents that I will share with you guys so that you, you can use them, right? These are documents that have come out of our design council. Uh, we've prepared them for the use within learning mate, right? So don't share it outside, uh, just keep it with yourself. Now, few few things that we have um, uh, defined as the traits of somebody who's practicing design thinking is to have beginner's mindset we talked about it is to guess less which essentially means that we ask questions or we observe and we learn rather than making assumptions uh show and tell is the whole visual thing that i talked about be curious which is essentially always trying to ask questions and get somebody else's perspective experimenting as much as we can for anything that we do design uh, to solve a problem. We always experiment with a smaller beta or alpha team, uh, so to speak, try and put it in front of them and see uh, how they react to it and then continuously iterate and improve upon it. And then of course, last but not the least, the most important one is to focus on people rather than trying to make something which is comfortable for us, right? As a team, as an HR team, we would say that this is easy for us to roll out, but is it easy for somebody to uh, uh, to put it in action or use it is what 
it's all about that you focus on people rather than yourself, right? Um, uh, in user experience, we uh, I always go back and talk to the teams where people design because they feel that this is going to be a great design according to what they feel. But we're not designing for ourselves. We're designing for the end users. And the end users need to like it, no matter how futuristic your design is, no matter how good looking it is. But if people don't understand it, it's of no use. So we're not designing for ourselves. That is what we need to keep in mind all the time. I talked about defining problem statement, right? And this is the first step, uh, <coughs> if you remember, which is the key to understanding what exactly are we talking about. Um, let's say, I'll, I'll take an example, right? Um, of, I have been involved in some of those uh, pieces along with HR where we were trying to define something uh, new. Uh, we were doing uh, an onboarding process, I think some four or five years back, and uh, then we did something else. And I mean, as individuals, we get called and we participate in some of those things, right? Essentially, as individuals who are trying to participate uh, in in a in a cause, right? Uh, everyone comes with their own perception of what they're trying to do. So understanding the problem and the problem statement is a is is a key. So when uh, I'll, I'll take an example, right? Let's take some names. So when Jobin comes in and says we need to improve our communication protocols, right? Answering emails, for example, what he means in his head versus what you and I would think of are going to be two completely different things because it's just a statement which says we want to improve our communication policy. So the the first thing that we do is to ask questions and nail down on a problem statement that covers what the sponsor wants us to do versus what all of us want to do and what the end user would want to get accomplished out of it so in design thinking a clear and comprehensive problem statement is a prerequisite of idea generation the problem statement can help define the right point of view and design innovative solutions. Essentially, the whole idea was to come up with as many solutions as possible. And that can only be done if we have a common understanding of exactly what we are trying to solve, right? It cannot be a huge problem. It cannot be a very small problem, but it could be a problem that we can solve together in a time bound way, right? So the, the key keys to this is always start with the problem and never a solution. So let's not throw out solutions as soon as you hear a problem because it is always tempting. And there are a few people in the call that I know personally who would want to come up with, how do we, how do we go about this? How do we try and do something like this, right? That's very tempting to give away ideas as soon as we hear a problem, right? But, but the key here is to hold on to ourselves hold on to our ideas, but try and articulate the problem and expand it even further. Before we begin to pro solve a problem, we must understand what it exactly means. And a problem statement is a vital tool for consolidating and capturing the analysis results, which essentially means that we'd come up with some problem statements that are going to be used. Now, how do we do that? Uh, and why have a clear problem statement, right? So a clear problem statement helps in defining and developing a shared understanding of the problems with stakeholders in planning, uh, collecting the findings, in developing a success criteria, which essentially would be something that you'd go back and look at when you have created a solution, right? Uh, I'll skip some of these things. I'll share the document. You can read through it. But this is the key here. So the following questions, what, why, who, when, where, and how, is the key of creating a problem statement. So what is the problem? That's something that we always ask. Why is it a problem, right? For somebody, it could be a problem. For us, it might not be a problem at all. So understanding why is it a problem is a very important piece here. Who exactly has that problem? Who has the need? So somebody has a problem, but the need is from some other group or some other individual or some other department. So understanding that. When and where does the problem occur? Uh, and what, what point in the journey of uh, a process, let's say example, right? And uh, how is it solved today? Because like I said, that 
every problem that we hit on our day-to-day -day lives, for example, our access cards don't work, or our login to InfoWeb has a problem, or anything like that, right? Or start time, stop time has issues, and the calculations done is not right, correct? Or the timesheets that we fill has some issue or the other. But we have figured out some ways, because we are smart individuals, we figure out a problem, add a solution, to it on our own, or we learn from somebody sitting right next to each other, next to uh, next to us, and we try and un learn some solution, and we try and implement it all the time, right? So it's nine hour thing. So we'll do nine and a half, so that it becomes nine. All of those things we've, we've, we've all done in the past, right? So how is it solved today is the key, right? But when we answer or we get when we get answers to all of these questions then there could be a template which we can use to put down all the responses so initial questions of why who what when where how and then with that we come up with statements and the statement language is how might we what for actor so problem to be solved now this gives us a uh, uh I would say a syntax which makes all our how by to we statements exactly same. Easier to understand and easier to read and easier to articulate from everyone. Now think about it. How might we come up with a better communication protocol such that or so we have responses within 24 hours from an email set? Uh, right. Now this could be a statement which everyone would understand, but if I don't use the syntax, I might end up writing, I need to build a framework that would allow me to force somebody to respond back on emails within 24 hours, right? See the statements kind of mean the same thing, but essentially it is not reading the same way. So when we are trying to collect the data from three individuals who are trying to write how many statements, it becomes difficult for us to group them together or probably categorize them. So the way we write the statement, uh, and if you use the syntax, it really helps us to quickly articulate and come up with uh, a common understanding, right? With a collection of these problem statements, we, again, as a group, meet with the team and define what the exact problem statements would look like, right? Because a lot of us would do a common how might we statement. And then that becomes our uh, list of problem statements, essentially. The next big thing here is to know who the stakeholders are, right? Which would also come with, uh, with the section who has the need and who has the problem here. But essentially, understanding your stakeholder is very important. So any any uh, problem that we are trying to solve, uh, we have to have an overview of the stakeholders. Is this touching on uh, a customer? Is this related to uh, a location? Right. All of that is really important. So, to obtain the value of information for strategic and communicative planning, uh, as well as future activities, it really helps us to look at who is involved in this. Right. So who's the customer or the user who gets directly impacted with it? Outside of that circle, who's the internal stakeholder? Outside of that, who's the external stakeholder? And then the public stakeholders. Now, everyone gets impacted with the actions that the user is going to take here, uh, right? Any solution that we provide to this individual has an impact to all of them. So understanding all the stakeholders is really important before we try and get into uh defining our ideas right now i will quickly jump to some of the other pieces that could be used and we probably use it uh, day in and day out right the first thing is surveys now i've seen so many surveys uh that we that we float uh to our target audiences and we ask them questions but there is a way to use survey there's a way to write them and then, of course, there are certain areas only where only when you can use the service. You cannot really use service for every need. So let's understand that a little bit, right? Survey comes in very handy uh, when we are trying to learn uh, about the users or the customers. Now, think of this as more of a quantitative 
tool rather than a qualitative tool. Surveys can never result into qualitative uh, feedback. It would always give us quantitative feedback. It is just a way for us to validate uh, what we already know uh, with some with some numbers, essentially. When do we use a survey? Uh, so before we start thinking of the questions, what we want to put in the uh, in a survey, <coughs> uh, when we want to track changes over time, right? For example, if we have rolled out a process or we have we have added an improvement into our system, right? Uh, we would run surveys in periodic basis so that we capture the satisfaction of the users who are using that particular process or that improvement. And that's where surveys comes in handy because again we're talking about quantity rather than quality. You want to quantify your findings from user studies. So if we have come up with five or ten different problems, talking to users, taking interviews for a given problem, we can run surveys for where people can quantify them, where people can say, "I have this problem. I have this problem. I don't have this problem." So that it would give you, it would lead lead you into a direction that you'd want to take after the survey with the results, and try and solve the problem which hits the mass rather than a problem that that might have only hit five people in the organization. Right. So it gives you uh, a way to quantify your findings. And when you want to measure attitudes and intents uh, or uh, task success, that is where you run surveys. Now, surveys are not suitable when you want to discover user motivations and needs. So when you're trying to ask people what would work with you and what would not work with you, do you want to go out and play football or cricket? <laughs> motivations are completely different, right? And survey might not be the right tool to do that. Interviewing is the best tool to do that when we try to understand the motivations of users. Uh, you want to test the usability of a product. So if you have rolled out a new uh, skin for InfoWeb, or if you have rolled out a new module for tracking product projects, or we have rolled out a new uh, uh, way where people can upload their documents before they uh, before they are onboarded into Learning Made, right? Uh, these are surveys could be a good tool to use to understand the usability of the product, where, of course, there are certain other uh, frameworks that could be applied on top of surveys, but the survey could be a mechanism to gather uh, the usability feedback from people. Now, how do we create surveys, right? The effective survey always start with simple and clear goals. Uh, it is to the point and short. It doesn't have to have those 50 questions all the time. Right. Uh, think about it that as, a, as an individual, you're requesting somebody to spend time on a piece which he or she is not uh, uh, essentially entitled to uh, complete. Right. Uh, you're requesting for somebody's time. So essentially, the shorter the survey is, the better success it would give. I would open a survey and as soon as I see more than 10 questions, I might say that I'll come back to it later. Right. And I might never go back to it. So think about it that it has to be to the point short. Uh, you don't have to write passages for the question. It has to be maybe a statement and uh, some options that are predefined and given to me as multiple choice questions, which I'm going to select, or maybe a Likert scale that I would use to give a rating to a statement. Right. That's all I would want to do on a survey. And that is what uh, makes a su survey successful. Uh, start board, uh, start board, then move to specific sensitive topics, right? So essentially, uh, try and set the premise before somebody goes into a survey. Start with very basic things and then get to specific ones and the sensitive topics. As soon as we start with the sensitive topic, people kind of go away from those surveys. Uh, try and randomizing it so that we don't uh, get into the order bias. Uh, don't forget to ask concluding open-ended question. It is uh, it is the key. So is there anything else that you want to tell us? Uh, I've seen we are using it very uh, uh, beautifully uh, in our surveys. But essentially, having that as a key element, even if you don't feel that there has to be an open-ended question at the end, 
it is always advisable to use it. Even you don't feel that somebody is going to add it, please do keep that as the as the last question. Uh, do test it with the pilot users. And then, of course, send a polite email, carefully written, uh, which request people to spend time on surveys. Right? Whenever we do any kind of research, uh, user research for experience, for product, for anything, right? we always try and show or uh, provide a goodie for somebody who is participating with us because they're giving us their time. Now, it might not be. Uh, applicable in in all the cases that you would give away something for somebody to participate there cannot be a monetary benefit for every time somebody participates on every small little survey that you do but essentially telling them the benefit of taking that survey is going to be it, it, it would really change the way people look at it right some of the things that we should avoid is to use vague terms it has to be don't show that you can write very uh, <laughs> good English on a survey. Let's understand our target audiences. If it is very, very simple, uh, make it very, very simple so that anyone who even understands a little bit of the language would be able to understand exactly what you mean and answer the questions. Always avoid leading questions, right? Uh, avoid suggested wordings and ask questions in a neutral way don't agree or disagree on a statement right you don't want to lead people into asking the questions that you want them to answer right don't write questions like that and avoid asking two questions or a single question so essentially what if this and if yes then what this right so don't try and avoid some of those things and avoid uh, giving large number of questions or options in a grid uh, of multiple choice questions. So uh, if you're trying to say rate something between one and 10, don't give 10 radio buttons. Uh, use a different question type. Uh, and if you're trying to uh, ask people, where do you want to go for an, for the next office picnic, right? <laughs> it could be a drop down rather than a multiple choice question, right? So some of the things um, with a better form design could be also applied on surveys but essentially doing some of these things would really help you guys to capture what you want to really do that right the next big thing in order to understand people is to interview them and there are lots of good techniques that we need to use again coming from design thinking where we say we are interviewing people to understand them right give me a second i'll just go on mute for 30 seconds and come back. Excuse me. All right. All right, so we call it interview to understand rather than just interview because uh, it's not an interview interview, but um, it's it's a process where we try and understand what the real deal is. So considering a problem from a point of view uh, of a user and build empathy with the user is where interviews are used. Uh, it helps us understanding the user's need, emotions, motivations, and the ways of thinking. Some of you might have seen something called as an empathy map, uh, where there is a face in between, and then uh, we map out what the user is thinking, what is he saying, what does he feel, and what does he want, right? So that is a, a, that is a chart that you can prepare after doing an interview, right? So um, interview really helps us understand some of these things. It uncovers hidden insights like frustrations and motives. Uh, it helps us find out the task flows, the user preferences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there are a few techniques that I'm going to talk about, which is uh, five W plus H and ask five Ys, uh, which would really help you clarify a point. The how do we interview is a is a very crucial thing. There are experts who only take interviews because. Uh, there is an effective way of writing interview uh, and it cannot be really sitting with somebody and asking random questions 
right? That's not what interview is all about. So there are, uh, like I said, there are experts who only do interview uh, as their uh, profession. <laughs> so uh, writing uh, how do we interview is a very, very important piece to learn from uh, them, right? So introducing yourself, explaining the problem uh, is very important Trying to that we're trying to solve. How does the user who we are interviewing is going to get benefit out of what we are trying to do here would be a key in order to help them open up and talk to us. You can use a lot, uh, a few icebreakers uh, and make them comfortable. Uh, you need to build a small, uh, quick relationship with them because you might not know the individual that you're interviewing all the time, right? Uh, explaining that the interview is not to find a solution, but instead to learn something about motives is going to be uh, the biggest thing when you talk, uh, when you really meet somebody for an interview. So let's not give them solutions or let's not paint the picture of a future that you cannot promise. Instead, try and understand, tell them that you're trying to understand the problem and with that you would want to help them out. Right? That's good. That should be the key. Try to understand the interview's story all the time. Right? Do not influence the user. Do not cut them. Do not stop them. Do not use your own biases. Uh, do not use your own biases and assumptions when you're trying to talk to somebody. Right? Listen carefully and record everything. So normally people do a record. Uh, I mean, we use a recorder on our mobile phones or we use uh, uh, a notepad to write out all the important things, right? But essentially, it is all about trying to help them tell their story rather than we asking 10,000 questions and talking most of the time when we take interviews, right? Let them talk and let them say as much as they can. I mean, you might want to help them out initially with icebreakers and with some of these pieces, but essentially you want them to speak up. So let's not lead them into one direction where we've already set a bias in our head and say that we want to do this as a solution. Let's not do that. That just fails the whole purpose of the time that you're wasting on an interview. Please avoid the questions which can be answered with a yes and no. Never use them in an interview. Always have open-ended questions where somebody has to put together three or four sentences to answer your question. That is a question that you would want to ask. Don't ask a question, do you live in Bombay? Yes or no? That's not a question that you would want to waste your time with. So please not, don't ask that question. Um, towards the end of the uh, interview, try and summarize the expectations and needs. So whatever you've written, there is a time that you can use in the interview to validate and summarize what you've understood from that user. He or she is going to cut you off and say that you've understood me wrong. And please do that. Allow interviews to add anything else they want before you end the session. It's the important thing. Now, there could be small little tips and tricks, which we have uh, <coughs> written out here, where you can plan an interview and create a question map in advance. And I'll show you what the question map can look like. Write the topics you want to cover with why and how questions around each of these areas, right? What are the areas that you want to touch upon? Do not build a questionnaire, right, beforehand. So you're only talking about the question map and uh, area and a topic, right? You would want to create questions on those as the user answers that, right? Capture the journey stages in addition to the responses. It helps identify patterns at an early stage and gather unexpected insights and different thought processes, right? Now, something to remember here is anyone who follows a guideline can conduct interviews, right? Always pair up and have at least two people taking the interview so that one can ask questions, one can record it, one can uh, record the observations or take uh, the recording or summarize everything for you, right? Somebody who's taking notes. So having two people always is the best uh, recommendation to have, right? Uh, and then, of course, empathy interviews offer a unique opportunity for spending time with user. Now, you remember we talked about observe, and observe here is the key, and this is a, 
this is a tool with an observe phase when you're sitting with somebody seeing what they do in day-to-day -day lives but it gives us a unique opportunity for uh, listening to his or her stories digging deeper with uh, why and how questions now let's look at the template so the template here is you are recording the name age personal data date place of interview i mean things that are applicable here this is just a template you don't have to do everything that's mentioned here but there are key steps here right <laughs> question map what are the topics and these are the topics that i talked about that we should populate before we get into an interview the topics could be as simple as you want to understand the background of the user you want to understand his uh, motivations you want to understand his career what he has done before learning but if you're trying to interview somebody to uh, to get him into learning but right there could be certain areas if you're trying to understand somebody for a specific topic let's say we are trying to solve uh, let's say performance management right so there could be topics that you note down here and say and uh, add it predefined before you would get to it and then the question that you're going to ask is what how when and where uh, sorry what how when and how who and that would really help you to uh, ask those questions as you go through those topics the things that you're going to capture here is the journey right uh, for each area, you would have a journey that, this, that the user is going to tell you in his own story. And that is something that you capture here with, uh, with, a fel, uh, with, a, with a fellow interview that you're going to keep with you to help you out with that. Once you're done with the interview, with the journeys and the questions that you've asked and the responses that you must have captured, you can then note down the pains and the gains that the user feels or that individual feels from that point on where we can say, these are the things that he feels are positives from the current system or scenario or process or tool. And these are the painful areas that he or she feels that should be fixed, right? And that will lead you into what are the good things that you'd want to keep into the new system or the solution or the process or the policy that you're designing, but what are the pain areas that you'd want to solve, right? Now, you might want to interview and there's a thumb rule, right? So when you do, uh, when you show somebody uh, a new policy or when you show somebody a new experience, you normally go with the people with number five, right? That gives you the maximum output with the minimum uh, time spent, right? You can talk to 15 people, but essentially five is the golden number here. So if you talk to five people and try and understand their uh, problems, right? interviews could doesn't have a number five, right? But essentially, if you try and, talk to let's say x people uh collecting their feedback in these pains and gains is really going to be uh the key towards the end right now some of the techniques on how do you probe people to answer the question not just scratch the surface is a technique called five wise which we use all the time this technique helps us discovering the true causes of the problem digging deeper to know more than just exploring the symptoms that are obvious and, uh, and, and gain surprising insects, right? The principle is very simple. Start with a beginner mindset, repeated why questions on one story or one response that you got, right? So let's look at it. <coughs> so we start with why is this a problem, right? Example uh, could be a problem statement, problem description, right? So I, I face this problem all the time you ask the first question could be why is this a problem based on the response you're going to again ask a why question and that would give you a direct impact why the next response right and then the third why would give you the cause and the effect the fourth why would give you the organizational hurdles and then the fifth why is going to give you systems to hurdles essentially five whys i mean you might not be able to put together five why questions out of one response but essentially as deep as you can go would really help you get the perspective and the motives and the thought process of that user what is he thinking about right so if you talk about a performance management and try to understand uh why do you think you didn't get the the right uh let's say hike that you were expecting there would be a response and then probably that person is going to talk about his manager and then he's going to talk about his division and then he's going to talk about the motivations that he uh, or the or the motives of the organization that he 
has somewhere hidden in his back of his head, he's going to spit it out. And that would really help you understand what that user feels about the organization, about his department, about his manager, about the whole uh, process of performance management, right? And these whys would really help you to go deep down and find the real problem rather than just saying that I need, I needed, I was expecting something more and I didn't get it, which is not really helping us anywhere. Right? Another technique is phi, why, and how. Now, this technique helps us capturing problem situations in a structured manner, observing more, more closely and dig deeper uh, when you discover something new, learn more about uh, the wishes and the opinions of the user or customer, and divergent phase to gain basic of overview and in-depth insights. Now, again, the template could be, and these are some of the questions where you can probably convert into the problem that you're trying to solve or the area that you want to uncover, and which is again divided into who, what, when, where, why, and how, and who is involved, what are they, what they already know about the problem, when did this problem start? Where does it occur? Why the problem is important, right? And how could this be a uh, opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next level, which is who's affected by the situation? What would like to, what would we like to know, et cetera, et cetera. Now these this problem template could be uh, used in anything that you want to gain insights on, and again, would help you. Uh, get more questions to be answered by the interview, uh, by the person that you're interviewing. <laughs> right. So these are two techniques that I uh, that I listed. I have normally used the first one here, which is called Five Wise, which is because it is easy. All we need is the list of uh, the name of the topics, and we can dig deeper as much as we can, depending on the individual that we're talking to, depending on the situation, and depending on the answers that he's giving. Right. So this is a very good one, uh, which is very prevalent in user research and could be applied to anything that we want to uh, get answers for. Uh, I talked about the empathy map, which is probably the result, which is the result of interviews. Basically, we locked out what the user is thinking, what did we hear, what does he say and do, what are the pains, what are the gains, and what do we see, right? So based on the way he's talking or she's talking, the based on what he or she is saying, but versus what or what he or she is doing, which would come from the observe uh, techniques, what are his or her pain areas? This would give you a template that can be presented uh, to the stakeholders that you are trying to uh, work with to solve this particular problem, right? So going back here, uh, we looked at understanding, observing, right? The define is where you collect all these information and put them into a definition phase where you now have a clear problem statement and you now have a clear understanding of uh, the users. You have observed them, you have empathized with them, and now you have a clear understanding of the problems that have come out of the interviews and the surveys and the other techniques that you might have used, right? So now it gives you a definition of what you want to solve rather than the biases that you would have had when you started with this whole thing. Now is the time where you converge and bring everyone together. So if you notice this dotted lines, this is divergent thinking where we are going on our own and trying to figure out what could be that problem that you're trying to solve, right? Understanding people, understanding their, uh, observing them and so on and so forth. And then coming back together as individuals and working together to uh, converge on a set of things that you'd want to solve, which are more important than others, right? You cannot solve all the problems. You might have, when you, when you talk to individuals, you might figure out that uh, a new person coming into learning might, might have 10,000 problems, but you only want to solve five of them. And that's what defined is used for. And then coming up with ideas is where you go back and scribble and sketch and do so many other things to come up with random solutions and random ideas, which are, which I don't focus on the quality. The whole idea in design thinking is to come up with the quantity. So as many as you can get is what the idea is, which is where you scribble and sketch and put your ideas into flowcharts and diagrams and whatever is the 
method that you can use and somewhere sit together as a team of three, four, five, how many you have appointed for initially when you started with the problem and come together and say that these are the words that we would want to build a prototype and test with our users and essentially testing it with them. And again, I, like I said, five is the key here. And then of course, reflecting. One more thing which I want to show you, which is a great technique that I use all the time. And we've successfully uh, come up with strategies for our customers. We've come up with lots of different problems that we were unclear and people were not able to articulate what they wanted, right? And what they wanted to solve rather yeah. is with lightning decision champs. Now, LDJs are essentially a technique which is time bound. It is, uh, it is where you bring all the stakeholders that you want to participate together in a time bound way for two hours, three hours, depending on the size of the problem that you're trying to solve, right? And get them together and try and use a template, which I'm going to show you in a while. And it really helps you find a direction which you want to go from, from the point you are where everyone is confused and nobody knows what, what they want, right? Now, where does Lightning Decision App help? It helps us identify the, and define the problem quickly. Uh, where all of us, right the competency team is thinking something else the uh, delivery team is thinking about something else the recruitment team is thinking about something else right the resource management thinking team is talking about something else and we all want to solve different problems how do we come together and 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 try and centralize ourselves with that one thing this is where lighting decision jam really helps right it helps us come up with a lot of solutions right solution is also something that we come up with we find the best solution that everyone agrees to as a group and then we arrive at the clear next action steps uh what are the next things that you'd want to do is something that comes up with the lightning decision jam as well now what does it look like right so this is our uh, template that we normally use <laughs> it's a perfect workshop tool solution to solve big problems quickly. Uh, the first thing that we do here is to define the workshop goals. It is a five minute activity and you would see everything is time bound. Everything has a time defined. You use a, uh, you use a, a watch with a timer and then essentially as soon as the timer is off, you have no more, you know, you're not spending time on this anymore. So defining a workshop goal is the key here where you start with a vision uh, statement, right? Based on a common understanding, but you validate here. If somebody has a point of view, they can use those five minutes to write those statements here in a collaborative way, right? Using a tool like Miro or uh, whatever, uh, right? There are whiteboarding uh, tools that Google also provides on the calls today, right? We can use that. Or it could be on a on a uh, in office setup where if everyone is in the office, we can use whiteboards to do that. That's the step zero to define the workshop goals. Step one is what will make us successful. Now this is key. Now this is where everyone comes in and every stakeholder who has a say in this whole thing would be able to help us with what are the success criteria, so to speak, for a problem that we are trying to solve right or an improvement that we're trying to make right the next step is what is stopping us to achieve the goals that we've set in step one so we want to be uh, let's say x right we want to have uh, uh, x thousand uh, employees for example right uh, that is a success criteria or x million dollars in revenue what is stopping us to achieve this right are there uh, and these areas are really going to help us dig deeper and probe even further to find out the real problem and try and solve it right which is step two step three is to prioritize problems so you might end up having so many problems that you would have defined as here right what is stopping us uh we don't have the system we don't have the tools we don't have the infrastructure we don't have the right people we don't have blah 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 all of that but essentially what is it that you'd want to solve today is the prioritization thing right once you've done that, you would come up with reframing these problems into standardized challenges, which is what I showed you as how might we. So then writing it into a format that is understandable by everyone, that is easy to articulate, and it has a syntax so that it can fall into categories easily is what step four is used for. Again, it is a five-minute activity. 
And then towards the uh, step five, we create solutions. So with these problems that we might have come up with, so we might have started with uh, 50 problems, we nailed down into priority of five things that we'd want to solve. Now we create solutions for all those five, as many as we can, right? And then we prioritize the solutions and essentially the actual items is also defined here. Now, let's look at what the template looks like. So we talked about the vision here. This is a sailboat activity. So whatever lies above the water are the positives, which is essentially fast forward and fails. So fast forward is looking uh, at probably a, a media release that you'd want to do one year down the line to talk about your business, for example, or to talk about a division, or to talk about, let's say, your onboarding process or your performance manager, whatever, right? That we have now rolled out businesses. In software terminologies, we think of this as a release of a software, right? And we say that it's going to have all of these AI tech, uh, tools and techniques and you'd be, it is going to solve all the problems that people come uh, face today. And that's the fast forward. So all the positive things are written as post-it notes here on top, right, of the water. So they stay, stay on top. What goes beneath uh, the water is essentially what is holding us back? What are the negatives? Which is what I told us, uh, which, I, which is what I mentioned here in step two. What is stopping us to achieve these goals? That's all mentioned here. Once we are done with adding all the problems that each of us individually see who's participating in a workshop, the next thing is to vote, and which is where prioritization comes into piece. We normally use dot voting, but essentially we ask people what everyone feels about one of these things that is mentioned here everyone gets limited number of votes so that they don't we don't come to us we don't run into a situation where all these notes are prioritized and everything is what we want to solve today that's humanly impossible and it's going to be a three-year project nobody would want to get into so essentially what we do is we give everyone three votes right every participant gets three votes and they need they get to pick the three best problems that they would want to solve. Essentially, the maximum number of votes is what is going to help you define what are the three or four things that you'd want to solve after the prioritization is done. That also helps you understand somewhere what everyone is thinking in their heads when they come to this workshop. And the priorities, so priorities from a division head to priorities from a competency head to a technology head to an HR head, this is the tool that helps you see what they're taking in their head. This is a place where you would see what people are saying versus what they feel are completely different things. Okay. Once we've done that, then, like I said, we would do a reframing of the problem into standardized challenges where we write how might we statements. Again, writing those problems into a specific format. This is all uh, it is about, right? And then the last, uh, and then the fifth step was to create solutions. So for each, how might we, right? How might we create a uh, onboarding portal, for example, right? Now the portal could be a problem that we want to solve, but what are the ideas for it, right? Can we use a WordPress? Can we uh, build an extension to InfoWeb? Can we do a Google form, a basic thing, right? Essentially, as many things that comes to your head, right, as participants, we log all of that here. Again, we do a voting after we're done with all of this and see what people are thinking. Sometimes people want the best pieces to be done, right? Somebody might come up with an idea and everyone is going to vote for, let's say, we want to have a, <coughs> we want to have a Salesforce implementation, for example, right? It might take us a year to do that, but there could be people in a team and uh, decision makers who would come up with and say, we want to build the cheapest and the fastest solution here. So let's do a Google form, right? And essentially the ideas get voted again, like we did the problems here on the left, right? We again do the same thing. Everyone gets to choose three votes and they can apply on each of these how might ways. And we come up with first possible directions and the solutions that the team or the stakeholders want to take, right? Essentially, that leads you into the action items or the next steps that would help you define what everyone wants and as a team, what would make us successful. That is what we call as lightning decision jam. It's called lightning because it is super fast. 
you don't have to spend days and weeks to think about a creative solution. Everything is in your head. The first thing that comes to your mind, your intuition is going to be the, the best thing. And that is what design thinking says that we need to come up with the maximum number of ideas. And maximum number of ideas can come within a short span of time. And that is what this is all about. So this could be a tool. I'm again going to share this link with you guys. You can do it in any format. I've done it on Google Slides. I've done it on uh, on, on an office on a whiteboard. I've done it on Miro. I've done it on uh, various other tools, right? I've also done it on a Google Doc, right? You can do it anywhere, but it just helps you run a workshop in a meaningful way and come up with a final action statement towards the end. All right. Now let's go back to our presentation. Any questions so far? I know I've been just talking, uh, but if there are any questions, please do either write it on the chat or let me know. Okay, I'll take that as no questions. So I'll quickly move forward, uh, which is implementations of HR. Um, now, there, there are these areas that we've listed down as employee onboarding, employee engagement, performance management, employee retention, well being, as well as diversity and inclusion, right? Now, let's understand each of these and understand what the problem is and how can design thinking help you uh, with the solution. Let's take the first one, employee onboarding. The problem could be, and I'm just making up some problems. There could be like 10,000 problems. People who are involved in uh, employee onboarding, our recruitment team would have so many insights that we don't even understand. But essentially, I'm just giving some examples. And think about it from your own uh, uh, perspective of uh, where you are at and what you're doing uh, as part of these, uh, uh, these individual items here. So uh, let's take a problem. So employee onboarding can have a problem where the employees struggle with navigating the company's policies, procedures, and culture. I think this problem applies to us, right? I think most of us would agree. <laughs> uh, the design thinking solution could be empathizing with the new employee, gathering information on their challenges, and idea ideate solution that makes onboarding smoother and more engaging. Now, prototyping such solutions, such as creating interactive onboarding experiences, providing personalized welcome kits, and organizing mentorship programs can help test and refine solutions. Now, I understand we do all of these, right? We have a personalized interactive onboarding experience. We have uh, a welcome kit thing. We see all the time on info, uh, sorry, LinkedIn. Uh, we have a mentorship program as well. I have been part of some of those pieces myself. But the question is, is that enough or is there a room for improvement in that whole piece? The key here is people, right? Now, the culture that somebody is going to transfer to the uh, incoming employee is going to be the key here. So choosing the right mentors do we have a system in place to do that is a question that we can ask ourselves, right? And maybe improve upon it where we say that not anyone can be a mentor because first he or she needs to understand what we go by as a company, what are our, what are, what are the things that we uh, are proud of, what are the things that we would want to give away to our next incoming uh, generation, for example, right? As a culture, right? And that could be a question that we can ask ourselves using some of the principles that we just talked about. Uh, the next thing is employee engagement. The problem could be the employees feels disengaged and uninterested in their work. Due to COVID, due to work from home and all of that, people are disengaged, right? So the design thinking solution could be to empathize with the employees, understand their motivations and needs ideate solutions and create a more engaging work environment. Now, how do we create a work environment which is more engaging is what design thinking can help us, which is where we start observing people. We start understanding what is it that makes them work from home and not come back to office? What are the challenges that they face while they're in office? And if we give them enough motivation to come back 
and uh, work in an environment and how can they solve their problems quickly while sitting next to a colleague uh, those are the things that would help us create a type of solution which would really help us uh, solve a problem with the engagement. Right? The next thing could be performance management. Now, a problem could be performance evaluation process and, and the time consuming and stressful for both employees as well as managers. Now, we have, I mean, again, I'm not saying we haven't done anything on these. All of them have something some improvement or the other in the past three or four years right but essentially what we're talking is can we empathize with our employees and managers again can we understand their challenges and their needs even with the monthly performance thing that we do even with the closure of the project that we do today right uh is there a room for improvement is that is that the be is that the best solution that we have today maybe not right how do we improve upon it Right, where we talk about the regular check-ins, the continuous feedback, make it mandatory uh, somewhere, uh, forceful at times as well, and the self-assessment tools also, which can help us test and refine solutions. Again, some of these pieces are already in place, but how do we improve upon it is what is I think it can help us. Retention, high employee uh, turnover rate uh, is affecting the organization's productivity and bottom line. Now, how do we understand why exactly are people, I mean, it's a very straightforward answer. I think everyone on the call would have an answer in their head today, right? But there are problems that are beyond that, which we can't really think of because we, when we talk about retention, we always think of two things. I'm not going to name it here, but I'm sure everyone here has those two things in their head, but there are third and fourth and fifth things, five things, fifth option as well, which could be solved, right? Exactly. That's not the only reason. So what are those third, fourth, fifth things? Thank you, Zal. Those are the things that we uncover with the retention uh, problem that we want to solve, right? And try and maybe build a flexible work arrangement, create positive workplace culture, test and refine solutions that would really help us retain employees better than what we can do today, right? There are certain things in our hands. There are certain things that are not in our hands. So how do we solve the things that are in our hands that we can solve is what uh, we can do with some of those pieces that we just talked about. And of course, uh, well-being is again an important piece where employees are experiencing high levels of stress and burnout, uh, which we saw last year. I'm sure we're going to see it this year as well. But how do we ensure that uh, we can prototype a solution uh, such which would offer wellness programs, flexible work arrangements, promote work-life balance, and can help test and refine these pieces, right? Again, uh, we've started working on some of these, but are they implemented in the true sense or they're just implemented for the sake of implementation? There are always right intentions to do things, but again, there is always a room for improvement. So what is that improvement that we can do in order to make sure that the employees have a well-being that is expected by both the employers and the employees? And then of course, diversity and inclusion organization lack a diverse and inclusive work workplace culture and we have seen that in our organization as well so how do we use design thinking to empathize with our employees understand their perspectives and experiences and incidences that have happened in the past and come up with solutions that create more diverse and inclusive workplace culture where everyone has a voice right uh, and uh, we have examples for those. Some of, some of us really have examples of how uh, we have tried and implement uh, some of those pieces, but where the problems are. So understanding the stories for some of those individuals who have faced uh, uh, these issues uh, is going to be the key. And then, of course, prototyping solutions and creating employee resource groups offering diversity training and promoting equal opportunities can help test and refine some of these solutions, right? So these are, I think, six or seven odd areas that could be, I mean, that I could think of 
uh, quickly. There could be a lot more that we can come up with, but essentially, some of the things like defining the problem, uh, having a clear understanding, bringing, writing a clear problem statement, defining who your stakeholders are, running a survey in a proper manner, interviewing people using some techniques other than for the sake of interview, keeping our biases on the side, building an empathy map, doing maybe a workshop with lightning decision jams, right? Essentially makes it fun and a team sport. And that is what design thinking is all about. Rather than taking things very, very seriously, it is all about having fun in the process, right? Trying to understand everyone's everyone else's perspective and doing things in the right way with a clear motivation is what it is all about. So focused on people, driven by curiosity, mindful, accepting complexity, and having uh, a team that is interdisciplinary to solve a problem is what it is all about, right? I hope this was helpful. There are a lot more techniques. There are maybe hundreds of tools, thousands of tools that are used. But I could think of these ones as the first things that you can experience and try and use it in your day-to-day -day lives in order to solve some of the problems that you face day in and day out and try to build solutions, right? This could be our starting point for implementing some of the tools that design thinking offers. All right, that is where I end today. Uh, any questions, any suggestions, please do write back and uh, uh, body up, uh, we can connect and see if there are any future needs. All right. Sure, Gaurav. Thank you so much for this informative session. Thanks, everyone, for joining and spending time on this. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gaurav. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Gaurav. Bye. Thank you, Gaurav.